Hi everyone, this is Michael Tierra, and uh, this is the second part of the Medicinal Plants of the High Sierra and Owens Va River Valley, presented by Benjamin Zappin. It will go for about an hour and a half, and I'd like to introduce Ben now. And uh, Ben, uh, your screen, I presume, is all set, and I'm going to transfer it to you. Okay. Are you there, Michael? Yeah. Okay. Were you going to introduce me or anything? I did. Oh. Um, so is your screen's up now. I'm ready to show my screen. Okay. So just looking at the names, it looks like there's quite a few different attendees, if not a majority of the attendees being different from the last time. So I'm going to sort of start off where we left off with the last webinar and um, move through some different material and then go back and recap some of the things that we didn't do last week or that we did do last week uh, or two weeks ago and so the new participants can hear about those because I think it's really fun and exciting uh, what we're looking at for those who are new uh, we recently took a field trip I run an institute called Sylvan Institute of Botanical Medicine we did a field trip my uh, good friend Darren Huckle, another herbalist, Brian Weisbach, and we, we brought Michael out. Michael, my dear friend and teacher for so many years. It's the first time I got to go camping with him in our whole, you know, 17 year history of knowing each other. So it's really exciting. And some of that charge I hope carries forth through this uh, lecture today. And then I went and spent another week plus with my uh, wife doing wild crafting and backpacking, so wild crafting for our business called Five Flavors Herbs. And you may hear a little bit more about that, some of our formulation strategies. Um, <clears throat> so the three main organizational schema that we've grouped around uh, this lecture today are looking at what we see here, the Owens Valley Respiratory Health Fields. Uh, the other groupings are apiaceous plants uh, that grow and then herbs for pain and uh, affecting consciousness, herbs that are nervines that also grow in the High Sierra. So part of our trip was in the High Sierra all above 8,500 feet, uh, a round tree line, you know, so you get to about 9,000 feet and there ceases to be any trees or very few and you go higher than that and, you know, it's, it's alpine and, you know, the, the flora is really remains diverse and it's really exciting and that's where there's a lot of uh, dramatically effective medicinal plants that I use in my clinical practice and that I use in formulation and products that we make you know every day. Um, the Owens Valley is the valley to the east of the Sierra Nevada range. For those who don't know what I'm talking about, the Sierra Nevada is a mountain range in California um, that is butts up against Nevada. It's in the eastern side of the state. Uh, starting at about Bakersfield north and sort of technically tapers off towards the northeast corner of the state of California. The Owens Valley is that which is uh, adjacent. It is high desert. It runs adjacent to the Mojave in the south and then just kind of increases up to high desert. Um, the drainages out of the High Sierra into the Owens Valley are particularly lush. The flora is particularly diverse. Um, once was the kind of heyday homelands of the Western Shoshone tribes um, who now live on reservations out there on the east side. Uh, Eastern Slope uh, was also home to several Japanese internment camps. Really interesting history out there of human habitation. Most of the water is now drained from the Owens Valley into the LA Basin and read about that history in the book Cadillac Desert. Um, anyhow, so when we came down from our high country field experience uh, with my wife Ingrid and I, uh, we noticed that the brakes on our van had problems which wound up creating us needing to spend a couple extra days in the town of Bishop uh, which we didn't plan on getting our brakes repaired. 
And what we, um, Michael rode my van and could testify that the brakes were shoddy. So we wound up spending quite a bit of time walking around and my disgruntlement with having to spend extra time in a, you know, a one horse town getting the brakes fixed um, was alleviated when I was walking back to the crappy hotel room we got and started to see what was around there and what these you know drainages that are used for irrigation but you know they're really pure snow melt glacial melt um, are feeding you know what is what is fairly lush soil and started to notice patterns really quickly and you know as I mentioned this the theme here is patterns of uh, common denominators growing uh, side by side be it by uh, different plant families or different common uh, indications or actions that are exerted by the plants. I started to notice really quickly that, and just it was hilarious that the the common denominator here was plants that are beneficial for the respiratory system. Now there's acres and acres of fields of plants that were beneficial for the respiratory system. So I'm going, going to introduce uh, seven of those that I use quite a bit. Um, to varying degrees, and we'll introduce those as I use them, introduce them as they may be used in Chinese herbal medicine, um, and we'll go from there. So without any further ado, ambrosia is a asteraceous plant in the sunflower family. It looks little to nothing like a sunflower family. It probably looks more like a um, here, the specimen probably looks closer to its more closely related uh, mugworts, right? The Artemisia. So this is actually Ambrosia Artemisia folia, is the name of this particular species. This is one of my favorite plants to celebrate. Um, it is a very, very profound antihistamine, and it's the herbalist that I know who like to use it say that they, and I agree with this, you know, that they wish that all the herbs that they knew of worked as quickly and efficaciously as this, as non-mysteriously. And uh, so we're, we're talking about using this for predominantly, I predominantly use it for allergic rhinitis. It can also be used for um, topical allergic conditions, topical IgE mediated, uh, that is immunoglobulin. E mediated allergic responses on the skin to internally or externally, internally consumed or externally contacted allergens. Um, also useful in formulas for allergic asthma. So we're going to go through all these and then we're going to talk about some different possible combinations of these plants and things that you might combine them with. Uh, so ambrosia, uh, I prepare as a tincture. We harvest the tops fresh. I here it is growing in the foreground also. Uh, you can see in seed. Um, I also use a species that grows in the desert, Ambrosia dumosa. There's a species that grows in California on the coastal bluffs that grows in this, actually on sand dunes that I've used a little bit that I found equally effective. Um, you can get in commerce. You can uh, obtain, there's a couple companies that carry Ambrosia artemisia folia. Um, that grows in the Midwest around farms. If you went to the Traditions in Western Herbalism conference this last month, it was one of the predominant ground cover plants growing around the conference grounds. Uh, it works both as a decongestant, meaning that it uh, tends to dissipate uh, mucus in the sinuses. That's why it, it tends to have a strong tropism towards the sinuses uh, for really thin, clear runny mucus. Unlike some herbs that are effective for this, I don't find it to be too drying. Um, from a energetic perspective, I'm going to say that this is uh, acrid and slightly bitter. Now, you don't see anything that exactly corresponds to the concept of uh, seasonal allergies or um, allergic rhinitis exactly in older Chinese medical texts. It's a, it's a newer construct. Um, so the herbs that alleviate wind and heat 
which I would say this is one of, many of them have indications for treating uh, sinus conditions, but don't quite have the potency of antihistamine effect uh, that something like this will. So I'll use it in tincture dosage of anywhere from 15 to 30 to 90 drops, uh, depending on how drying you want to be, uh, and we'll also use it for, uh, use it in formulation. So, so it's actions, you know, you'll say that it clears wind, clears heat, uh, clears mucus to some degree, but really what it's profoundly efficacious for uh, that the Chinese action types don't really address is stopping that immediate allergic response. You're allergic to cats, you're allergic to seasonal pollens, be it grass or trees, and break out in, you know, with itchy eyes and itchy nose, um, sneezing, runny nose. This will address all that. And it'll address it for the individuals for whom it will address it and reduce it. Uh, it is profoundly quick. You know, that you'll, you'll be noticing a responsiveness uh, to this particular herb within 30 seconds. You know? Not many herbs work that fast. Not many, not many drugs work this fast. And I've given this to a lot of people who've suffered from allergies for decades. And they wish they'd had arrived at it sooner. I predominantly encourage people to dose with this herb uh, acutely. Uh, and in the allergy season, may give them a bottle of it to dose chronically with. Most people I have use it acutely. I know some herbalists are more keen on using it as something to uh, take over time. Um, my experience is more using it acutely. Uh, interestingly, ragweed is purported to be a major allergen, and it is for many people. Uh, I have seen very few to know people. I've, you know, in discussing this with other herbalists, very few people have reported seeing people who have ragweed or, you know, broad spread allergies to Asteraceae plants reacting to this, which is, which is really interesting. You know, it is, it is vilified uh, across America as a major allergen and, you know, paradoxically, not homeopathically, because we're giving a gross dosing of this plant, um, but paradoxically, uh, you know, tends to really knock out an allergic response, um, as I mentioned, to grasses, to um, trees, pets, cats, uh, dust. Um, seems, seems to work across the board. Um, what is the mechanism of action? It seems to have uh, rapidly effective anti-inflammatory properties, as well as mast cell stabilizing properties. So these, these mast cells are, you know, the cells that are degranulating or opening up and releasing all these histamines uh, into the local vasculature of these regions that we tend to associate with uh, the allergic response, the eyes, the nasal passages, the sinuses, um, etc. So, Michael, have you had an opportunity to use the ambrosia that I gave you recently. You know, I had a, a patient who I was thinking of using it, and I wanted to ask you, since you've had more experience with it than I have, she said she's so uh, allergic to ragweed, supposedly, that uh, she's afraid of taking it internally that uh, because, because it, I guess, I guess it, uh, it causes, it causes a severe allergic reaction with her. So I don't know whether that would be appropriate to try it or not, so. Well, uh, in other words, if, my, people are, if people are tested to be allergic and they're having severe, you know, allergic reactions to it, you still give it. I guess my approach to that would be to let the choice be hers, but I, what I believe a safe method to be would be to, one, ask her the severity of her reaction. And if severe is throat closure, needing epinephrine. That's what, uh, it, that's what it was. I, in that case, I might skip it. <laughs> um, but if somebody just had really severe upper respiratory 
responses uh, that didn't result in risk to self. She needed um, ephedra, and I gave her, I sent her a tea of ephedra tea because uh, she was getting asthma and so forth. So she was afraid to take this, but uh, uh-huh. she was allergic to everything. But I was yeah. tempted tempted to say, okay, we'll take five drops of it and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, or, or start with one drop and uh-huh. and have the ephedra with you. Right. You know, and know that you have a, a counterbalance option. And while I while I have the everybody's attention, I wanted to say that there's a chat place at the bottom of the on the scroll bar, and I've sent uh, Linda and Richie and Roswitha a message to, uh, as a test to find out if you're hearing and viewing the webinar all right. And I haven't heard back, so I don't know if it's because you guys haven't noticed the chat place, but that's a place where even while we're talking, you can uh, uh, type messages and comments and so forth, and I can be. Uh, interacting with you in the background here. So check that out if you would. Okay, proceed, Ben. We, 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 need, okay. we need to finish by seven o'clock tonight. That's about an, okay. another uh, hour and 15 minutes. Okay, well, I'll keep moving. Um, Soledago is a wide ranging uh, genus, also known as goldenrod. I know there's a lot of herbalists out there with a lot more experience with this than I have. Uh, it is useful for both um, the respiratory tract. As, as we'll see, there's, there's a lot of herbs that tend to benefit both the respiratory tract and the urinary tract in kidneys. Um, Solidago shows up as a useful herb in the treatment of urinary tract infections. Uh, in the case of both kidney infections and kidney, uh, now we're talking from a Western biomedical perspective, not a Chinese medical perspective, um, but a, a kidney functional impairment. Uh, you see, now I haven't, I don't have any experience in this. Uh, there's a eclectic formula that a couple different practitioners, our friend Brian Weisbach and Eric Yarnell, uh, advocate for that has Solidago and an herb called Lespediza in it, that they both have treated multiple people and purport what, from a biomedical perspective, is outright uh, you know, miraculous results in improvement of renal function um, that I believe that they attribute primarily to the herb Lespediza, which I've never used, um, in conjunction with Solidago. So you find more information about that on uh, Eric, your Yarnell's urology series that we have on uh, Sylvan Institute of Botanical Medicine. Um, but Solidago is a respiratory herb. It's, it's goldenrod. It is perhaps erroneously also purported to be a major allergen. Uh, but I also use it as a decongestant. There's uh, references to eclectic physicians using it as a decongestant. That's, that's been my gravitation over using it for renal and urinary tract support. Um, But here's an example of what I was talking about, of Solidago growing adjacent to uh, Ambrosia. So I'm going to move on. Xanthium strumarium uh, is also known as cockleburr. And cockleburr is zang ardza in Chinese medicine, and one of our premier Chinese uh, sinus herbs. It's not just used for, uh, its indications are not just for wind heat and wind cold, for which it's indicated for both. Um, That is, uh, you know, cold condition with uh, onset of sinusitis. Um, But it's also indicated for facial pain associated with sinusitis and has an analgesic component to it. So there's a basic formula uh, called Tsang Artsan, or Xanthium combination, that is one of the, the premier modifiable formulas for facial pain and sinusitis uh, associated with allergic response uh, that also combines Bijur Angelica, or Angelica Duhurica, uh, and a few, few other herbs that aren't jumping into the top of my head. Um, but it's a, it's a simple four or five herb formula. And I'll combine this 
with uh, ambrosia. That's one of my favorite formulas to use, is that combination. And to use it as a base for sinusitis, to use it as a base decongestant slash antihistamine formula. Uh, what is used at the plant is these spiny seeds from which it derives its name cocklebur. Uh, and I do feel like the quality of what you get from China, depending on your source, can be really poor and, and think that you know, this is getting things fresh and domestic uh, is preferred. My understanding, there is some association of toxicity uh, with these. What I learned from uh, some courses with John Chin, who uh, has written a couple textbooks, uh, who's also a pharmacist, is that you need to dry fry off the spines, and that is where the toxicity resides. It's both a traditional preparation method, and that is a method that's commonly employed. Uh, as this plant commonly grows in irrigation zones, um, this is a doctrine of signatures thing. A lot of these plants grow in riparian areas. Uh, they grow in um, drainage ditches, disturbed areas where, there's, where there is good flow. They affect the waterways of both the sinuses, and they affect the kidneys and the bladder. That doesn't mean you can go pick any plant from these regions, but it, but it, you know, it is it is part of the, the poetry to be looked at in terms of associations, common denominators. Um, <clears throat> so xanthium, very useful plant uh, in relation to the it growing in waterways. As with all these that we're talking about, you want to know where that water's flowing from, and you know not just the top of the mountain, but if it's coming through pasture lands, you want to note, is it flowing through animals, uh, regions in which animals are grazing? In which case, you know, is it covered with feces? Do you want to wash your plants more carefully and cautiously? Uh, is it running through agricultural regions in which there is uh, pesticide runoff? That, in which case, you may not want to pick from those areas. So this is always really important consideration. Um, that wild crafting is not just about going to a place and picking things that are useful clinically or that you want to relate with. It, it's not just uh, relating to the land within a, you know, a, a, a 10 meter area around the plant that you're harvesting, but it's looking at the whole ecology and you know, what, it, what is serving that area and, and how, how humanity might interface with that. Uh, so we'll move on past Xanthium. Again, it's Sangerza. It's C-A-N-G-E-R-Z-I. Any thoughts on that, Michael, that you want to share? It seems that uh, this herb is being used uh, by a lot of uh, Chinese herbalists as, a, um, as the alternative to uh, Ma Huang for allergies and upper respiratory types of problems like that. I don't know exactly how appropriate that is, that is, but um, I know that, uh, that many of the formulas that call for Ma Huang are now just uh, increasing or have, are using xanthium instead. And um, so anyway, I, I, that's all I have to say about it. Um, it is fairly widespread throughout the United States. Yeah, that's it's, going to be a hard herb for for anybody to ban because we, you know, it, it is it is actually a noxious weed, uh, and uh, so I, I don't know that you'd want to plant it in your garden, plant it in somebody else's garden, or <laughs> in a in a vacant lot somewhere or something like that. But but those those spines get around pretty far, and so that's one thing to keep in mind about it. And uh, so. Dry, dry frying, as I understand it, is how you get rid of the uh, spines on it, right, Ben? Yeah, that's, I, I just mentioned that. Right. So in other words, yeah. you heat up a When you order from a Chinese like, supplier, they won't have the spines on it. Right. Well, that's about it. Yeah. Um, so here's verbascum thapsus, uh, which is commonly known as mullen. Uh, this is the western gateway to the Anderson or the Eastern Gateway off Highway 101 to the Anderson Valley, a really nice field of mullen. Um, 
you know, there, there's a lot, a lot to be said about this plant, and you know, multiple parts are used. People are using it as a topical anti-inflammatory, uh, both the stalks and the flowers for mucous membranes, um, using the roots for uh, using the roots as a urinary astringent, particularly in children. I have not seen that work myself, but there are a lot of people who swear by that clinically. Have you tried um, it? Uh, I haven't. Okay. And and or if I've put it in formula, it's it's out of a good faith gesture. Right. So it's, it's one more, of those things when it, the root you know, the root is so substantial to Mullen, and everybody's really tempted to really believe that it has some great properties, and I guess it does, but I I, I don't know what they are. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're you're an area astringent in children, yes. I believe there is a Christus Sinodinos is a Humboldt County herbalist who has a write up on it um, that you know really weighs Christa? weighs all the literature on it. Christus Sinodinos. C H R I S T. Yeah, S I. I'll I'll uh, type it out in a bit. Okay. Uh, but she is a student of Michael Morris, and he is actually who started teaching that. Uh, the root, I remember, Michael, remember when uh, American School, you brought in Rena White Star to do some teaching? I think so. It's a long time Native ago. American, Native American woman, 1995. Uh, oh, right. I remember. Yeah. If mm -hmm. you can remember 1995, you weren't really there, right? Um, anyway, she, she taught that you could burn part of a dried mullen root and inhale the smoke through your nostrils to treat sinus infections. And I've tried that a few times. And uh, if you don't enjoy breathing hot particulate matter in your nostrils or any part of your body, don't start. Um, but it was, you know, it was interesting. To, and it's the only time since then that I've really seen somebody advocate for a uh, smoke inhalant um, into the sinuses. But it, but it worked. I tried it. Um, Anyhow, the of course the leaves are what is popularly used with mullen, and I think most of our audience probably knows about this. Um, I just want to address it as, you know, from a Chinese East-West perspective, uh, because there there is some doubt out there. You know, the the question comes to what are our supplementing herbs? What are our tonifying herbs in the West? You know, and that—that that is what is heralded as so unique and great about Chinese herbal medical culture is that, well, they have, they have a better history of these supplementing herbs, and and that's where Western herbalists are looking for their supplementing herbs, uh, is the, um, you know, the Chinese repertoire. And to a large degree, I still agree with that. But mullen uh, is such a substantial, I believe, lung qi and yin tonic uh, in its ability to both upregulate function of the lungs uh, in a way that doesn't create dependency and facilitate healing of the tissue uh, of the lungs um, that you know I, th I think it's indispensable as a as a sub supplementing herb and thus I use it as such uh, so excellent for you know really uh, quite a quite a wide array of conditions but we're talking about uh, recovery from colds and flus um, for support and sustenance in individuals who've recovered from smoking and individuals with lung cancer. Uh, we'll talk a bit about whooping cough when we get to Grandelia, um, tuberculosis. You know, it's, it's not curative by any means, but is a really useful long-term adjunct, a safe long-term therapeutic adjunct uh, to supporting uh, a number of respiratory conditions. Uh, I tend to make fairly, I don't want to say watered down, but uh, low alcohol concentration tinctures of this uh, and or give it to people to take as tea. As you know, the hairs can irritate the esophagus and mouth. So you want to prepare the tea in a muslin bag. Um, I'll dose it fairly high. This is something that you know you can you can dose low, but because there is little to no toxicity, um, 
starting to consider some of our Western herbs that have reputations in you know, being used in teaspoon dosages or tablespoon dosages, start looking at inclusion of them in uh, concert with Chinese decoction therapy, or in the case with this, possibly steeping it at the end of a decoction, adding in the last minute or two of the decoction process. You know, in doses of 12 to 18 grams, uh, and I strongly believe that there's a greater medicinal effect to be derived from inclusion of this. Uh, and you will see people's energy levels pick up, and you will see more rapid recovery uh, of uh, people's health. Think of including it. Look at a formula, a Chinese formula like Sheng Mai San, you know, which has uh, Maimondan or Ophiopagan, Wu Weizhe or Shizandra, and ginseng, all of which nourish and protect the fluids of the stomach, the heart, the lungs, and support the spleen. Uh, I think. You know, this, this could find expression in conjunction with that formula or as a tincture along with that formula uh, in its role for definitely nourishing this, the lungs, if not also the stomach, uh, and facilitating recovery of vitality. Okay. I had a patient, Any... I had a patient uh, with severe emphysema and uh, the most effective Herbal combination I gave him was mullen, comfrey, uh, leaf, yerba santa, and wild cherry bark. Made as a strong tea, which he drank two or three times a day, and uh, he was able to get get around. And his emphysema was at least uh, 80, 80, 85 percent relieved by by just taking that that tea regularly. Um, what yeah. what else was in there, Michael? Repeat Com that, please. Mullen, comfrey. Uh -huh. Uh, yerba santa and wild cherry bark. That's actually uh, energetic set aside. The only difference I would make is if I wanted to warm this up, I'd add some fresh ginger to it. So, um, and I might also add a, a, a small amount of lobelia and flata, like like a quarter part or something like that. But uh, this tea is is very is very effective for uh, a patient with emphysema and. and severe shortness of breath when he was walking and this helped him tremendously. I had a quick, was, that recent, was that recently? No, this was uh, many years ago. Many years ago. <laughs> Over 20 years ago. I remember him very well but, uh -huh. because of that. And um, the other thing I wanted to say about Mullen is that its pain relieving properties are very much uh, underestimated. It, it, it is definitely analgesic topically applied. I think it's one of the one of the reasons why mullen flower oil is used to relieve earaches and things of that nature. I don't know that uh, it's as effective as a treatment for the ears as uh, just using straight echinacea tincture, a few drops in both ears. Um, I find that that works really well for relieving uh, even children's earaches. And uh, many people may feel reluctant to put tinctures in the ears, but remember that's the treatment for swimmers' ears to dry out the eardrum. So uh, that, that's a case where I think that uh, a few drops of, of uh, herbal and alcohol may be very advantageous since there's probably a mucus uh, component to many of these uh, ear problems that young children have. So <clears throat> at least uh, the mullen flower is oftentimes uh, made with uh, olive oil, and I think it's because of the soothing aspect, but I don't know that, uh, that how curative it is, and if it is, you better make it very strong. That's all I can say. And uh, so anyway, that's that's what I got to say about mullen. Um, it's pain relieving properties, and, it's, and it goes in Dr. Christopher's bone, flesh, and cartilage mixture, mm. along with comfrey and other things that he uses as a ferment. Is a, is a fomentation for healing broken bones and and, and uh, injuries and so forth. So there's a, there is a a, a, uh, a a tradition among Western herbalists the use of mullen for uh, as a, as an adjunctive herb for healing and treating uh, injuries and broken bones and, and, sp and sprains and things of that nature. That's fantastic. Um... Another underutilized herb that I've 
really been in love with this is so this is for looking from Bishop uh, out uh, from Highway 395 uh, out towards the Eastern Sierra right up here in the background uh, it's very dramatic so this is the biggest field of Grandelia I've ever seen and I was just ecstatic where is this seeing. the uh, Bishop uh -huh, which okay. is on 395 do you know where Mammoth is yeah you know, Tioga Road comes over to Levining um, right. through Yosemite, and then you drop south about 50 miles into Bishop. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so, you know, found a multi-acre field of Grindelia, and I was just beaming. And, you know, the first thing that I think of is I'm going to be able to subsidize our uh, repairs on our car, <laughs> you know, because I, I know what herbs I go through a lot, and you know, although it's not going to turn inst into instant money, I know that when I wildcraft, it's going to turn into money because I know I'm going to use all that in a year. Uh, I was like, oh, there, we're going to, on our walk from our crappy hotel to uh, the auto mechanic, we're going to pay for our car repairs. Um, so it it does it is a painstaking thing to harvest and uh, is optimally harvested at the time eh, a few minutes before we found it when these buds, this is also in the Asteraceae or uh, sunflower family, um, when these buds are producing a sticky milky resin um, that you can't quite see here. Uh, there's a really nice picture of it in uh, Thomas Guerin's Western Herbs According to Traditional Chinese Medicine book has a nice feature in the inclusion of this. So this has been used uh, by the eclectics. It first showed up in um, pharmacy texts in 1875 and really gained notoriety and was a, a kind of a plant of favor um, amongst Western herbalists uh, uh, in the U.S. National Formulary, etc., um, as predominantly as a respiratory antispasmodic and as a upper respiratory decongestant. In, and it's, it works on a couple of levels. And I think to describe it um, simply as a respiratory antispasmodic is, is to limit it. I think this is really a pure gentle expectorant. I think it's our most gentle expectorant. And expectorant is a term that tends to get bounced around to refer to, you know, quote unquote, anything that has to do with the lungs is an expectorant. But really, to to expectorate means to spit up, and it's, it means to get that stuff up rather than just to clear mucus from the lungs. So, oftentimes, for individuals who wake up early in the morning or are smokers and or have dealt with a serious respiratory infection in which the cilia uh, of their lungs is insulted in some way, making it more difficult for this expectoration to happen, or the cough reflex is dulled, you know, due to coughing over some extended amount of time. Uh, this this will make that individual who has respiratory suppression happy, and for the individual who has a hyperactive uh, respiratory response, who is hacking, this will settle down that hacking and produce a more effective and efficient expectoration. You know, so if you know somebody who gets up and hacks every morning, they're suffering. You know, they're, they're really suffering. This may be a useful single herb. Um, and we're going to talk about common combinations. Uh, maybe a useful single herb to, to facilitate a more meaningful expectoration while calming and sedating that hyperactive reflex of a cough that's trying to get this thing obstructing uh, the air passages up and out. It also tends to um, dissolve mucus. I really think this is also working on you know, the stomach and the spleen level of helping to uh, decongest. It can be useful in the treatment of both hot and cold phlegm. Um, I think it works more, you know, like I said, in the spleen stomach axis, uh, which is the source of phlegm and then also facilitating clearance from the lungs, but not particularly from the sinuses. Uh, so I use this in formulas for asthmatics, uh, along with all the herbs that Michael's been mentioning. 
uh, the mullein, the yerba santa, wild cherry bark, um, lobelia inflata. I think they work as a really good complement. Uh, I've had some opportunities to treat uh, the resurgence of whooping cough, which um, you know is a whole big immunological conversation about why it's happening because contrary to you know popular rhetoric, it's not just happening in pockets in which there uh, is under immunization. It is happening to uh, individuals who have been immunized. The reasons for that are pretty clearly understood uh, due to inadequate boosters, et cetera. Uh, but anyway, so I have been called upon to treat some individuals with whooping cough, small children. Uh, and when I first moved here to Oakland, my friend called and said, oh, this, this friend of ours, you know, they, they have whooping cough. Can you help? What do you have? And the mom, your phone number, and this woman really anxiously called me and said, I've heard you could help me. You know, down, we can't leave the house. Can you bring something over? So, so I show up and the CDC is leaving in, you know, their, their ET suits, you know, their, like, their, their suits, the decontamination suits, that is the Center for Disease Control. And, you know, that's treating it like a quarantine si situation, um, responding to, you know, what has been tested to be pertussis, a whooping cough. And you know, I, I meet the mom at the door, I meet the kid, the kid's okay, I hear the cough. Uh, it, the kid doesn't look terrible, but I hear the cough and it sounds pretty bad. Um, give her the medicines and the next day uh, she calls me to thank me and said, you got a good night's sleep, you know, that we didn't use any of the drugs that they gave us, because really it's a watch and wait kind of thing, it's something that has a, its own course that it runs. Um, and and or maybe they yeah um, so you know she, she she's like by the way who are you what what do you do she she didn't really question my credentials she just friend of a friend said I could help and I showed up with some some herbs there there was a simple blend like this of what we just mentioned of you know lobelia and grandelia wild cherry yerba santa. Um, Grindelia and Yerba Santa have a really long history of being used in conjunction with each other by Native Americans, by the eclectic physicians, uh, by some contemporary herbalists for the same upper respiratory conditions for treating phlegm, I believe, at the, the source that is the digestive system, uh, which is you know very very common denominator notion throughout different traditional medical systems, not just Chinese medicine. Uh, being able to clear respiratory phlegm that is both cold and hot. If the phlegm is hotter, I might use, uh, you know, one, I might use some demulsants in conjunction with uh, either Huang Chin or Scutellaria bicolensis or possibly um, Golden Seal, something like that. Uh, to to cool off that hot phlegm. Um, they are used for urinary tract infections. The secondary metabolites of both these herbs uh, are used uh, to treat infections. You know, to I, I don't know the exact biochemical mechanism of action, but they do have a strong history of being used internally as tinctures. They're both strongly resinous herbs and thus better extracted in alcohol than they are as tea. Um, they are also used topically for the treatment of poison oak, uh, topically and internally. Now, our uh, friend, colleague, Brian Weisbach, who uh, taught on this trip with us, says he will use these two herbs uh, in children with allergic, um, hyperallergic responses, any kind of IgE-mediated responses, including shellfish allergies, if they're breaking out in hives uh, while drinking breast milk due to allergic reactions to substances that the mom is ingesting, um, and not just environmental allergies, he'll use these two herbs and feels like that does create a cure. He told us that this summer. I haven't had an opportunity to um, see that work, but he really 
has his 40 years experience and I think it's worth giving a shot if you don't have another solution. So that is using Grindelia and Yerba Santa to clear heat um, you know, that is expressing itself as wind heat type rashes on the skin. Um, so really dynamic plant for topical internal use. Uh, I could say a lot more about poison oak treatment, particularly with this. Um, but remember the skin is you know, considered in Chinese medicine an extension of the lungs uh, to a large degree. And you know, other traditional medical systems tend to find agreement in that. So it does make sense that you can clear heat with the skin um, that's also affecting the lungs, which is also you know, an extension of the immune system that's being expressed when we look at uh, what is the Wei Qi in Chinese medicine. So Grindelia, this is looking towards the White Mountains uh, or the Inyo Mountains. Uh, this is really in the same field. One is looking, uh, this is looking west, this is looking east. There's a county fair happening. Um, we were treated to a uh, date at the county fair. That was really fun. This is Rose. Um, this is a native oh, wild. Uh, ben, before you go on to the Grindelia, I wanted to add a few things. Yeah, please. Uh, probably the most, it, it is the most singly, singly the most effective herb in the treatment of poison oak and poison ivy. So uh, apply it externally. Uh, this is a plant in which its resins are uh, responsible for its activity. And uh, there's a whole tradition of using resins from plants and, tr and tree bark for a, a number of things. But, uh, and, I, and I might uh, mention myrrh and, and uh, in Ayurveda Google. Uh, I'm not going to say that Grindelia is that, but uh, in looking over the eclectic li literature on, of Grindelia, it seems to have uh, the characteristic aspect of a plant with resins that uh, is, has both diuretic as well as expectorant properties. Uh, typically, an herb that is, when, you, when you're trying to emphasize its diuretic effect, in other words, the effect on the kidneys, you take it cooler, uh, and when you want to affect the lungs, you take it as a warm uh, preparation. Um, it's very, very specific for chronic bronchitis, and, and especially uh, bronchorrhea or chronic bronchitis and emphysema in older people, which can be very, very problematic for them. Uh, it can be smoked along with lobelia and uh, strumerium or just lobelia alone as a treatment for asthma. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, Elling, Ellingwood goes into a whole thing about Grindelia hardly mentioning its use for the lungs at all, which is really pretty remarkable. <laughs> uh, he's emphasizing anti-malarial properties and a specific for dullness, drowsiness, and dizziness. Dizziness uh, is, a, is a very common thing that I've seen in my clinic, and I have not used Grindelia for that, I have to tell you, but uh, I'm very amazed to see that uh, he says that uh, it seems as though equilibrium is uncertain. There's mild staggering and irregular gait where the head feels light and dizzy all the time. Uh, so this sounds like it has a, has a, a much, much, much wider use than, than most of us uh, who have been using it uh, can see, and, and that's based on the eclectics who were hundreds of different practitioners well, all over the country it, using it. And interestingly, one of the pathomechanisms uh, in Chinese medicine that might look like that picture is one of phlegm damp, you know, or phlegm room. Ah, you know, look, okay. look at the formula lingue jugantan, which is, you know, a high dose of fuling, uh, guajer, Gansao and Baiju, uh -huh. you know, that, that really strongly percolates dampness out and warms and dries damp for the similar kind of dizziness, uh, you know, moss, 
moss around the head kind of stuporous experiences, you know, specifically with um, the uh, dizziness upon standing. So it stands to reason that it's a similar pathomechanism um, that we're, we're thinking of, of, of draining phlegm and dampness out of the source. Right. Dull headache. Dull headache is another indication for it. Now, uh, do you make extract of uh, of uh, Grindelia, Ben? I do. I use I use a ton of it. It's one and, of my favorite plants. And I, I presume uh, you're using a high alcohol content, right? I yeah, I use a pretty high alcohol content. Probably just have started to gravitate towards using a little less alcohol. So may tincture it at seventy five percent rather than ninety five. Yeah. One thing, the eclectics also talk about using it as a uh, cardiac antispasmodic too, which I just, I've asked a lot of people about that who fancy themselves experts on the eclectics and nobody really has a read on it or, or a sense of this is, this is what that means or how I use it. I don't think that this, this herb goes very well as a tea. What's your thoughts on that? Because I don't think the, the resins go into the water very well. I I don't think they do either. Yeah. Um, I, I, I know I know that uh, Google Merv Google is is specifically depends on the heating properties and, and being able to capture the, the resins and condense them. So anyway, this this herb seems to have a lot more uses than than just for expectoration and uh, and probably Ben's. Uh, inference here of it being beneficial for phlegm dampness would be uh, very appropriate to consider. Um, the other thing that I want to say is that uh, when you when you see Grindelia and you, if you have a garden, just capture some of those seeds. It's very easy to grow in your garden. I have a, a plant that just makes seeds every every uh, every year. It's easy easy to plant this and have it propagate itself in your garden. And you can you can harvest it in a timely fashion without having to try, drive to the other to the end of the earth to find more of it. Uh, it used to grow very plentifully along the coastline uh, in, in the Santa Cruz area here where I live, but uh, because that, that's all been developed, it's very hard to find Grindelia along the coastline, at least enough of it to be harvesting. So I, that's why I took some seeds and put it in my garden up in the mountains. And you, you know, there's actually quite a bit of it right around uh, the levee, all around the levee near the Santa Cruz beach boardwalk. Yeah. I, I've, Tons of it. I, I've looked there and I haven't seen it recently, so I don't know if it's still there or not. But anyway, we can carry on. Yeah. Uh, so this is, you know, rose species. I don't have a ton to say about this because I don't, I don't use it that much clinically. Um, you know, my understanding is it's mostly used as a nutritive, as with many uh, rose family plants, they can be used as astringents. Um, the anecdotal information I have that people have shared with me, uh, besides making rose jams, you know, for their high antioxidant content, and I included this in here, you know, because we're looking at, um, you know, the uh, various high vitamin C content plants such as this uh, are being used. Uh, very commonly to uh, allay people's tendency to have allergic responses. Um, Michael, you might have more to say about that specifically. Well, um, I, I remember Ed Smith and I joking about uh, thinking of, of rose hips and possibly um, hawthorn berries as being interchangeable. I don't know if you would still say that today, but this was many, many, many years ago. I've often wondered about it, um, but uh, I do know that the rose petals is very, very specific uh, uh, for depression and for uh, mood disorders. So, yeah, yeah I've, I've never I used that a lot, and I've never used native ones for that. Uh -huh. Which ones do you use? Um, Meguehua, just. Chinese, you know, things Chinese. you buy from a Chinese supplier or from yeah, and those are actually actually little rosebuds. When I yeah, buy it. no, I know. So, but I've I've never harvested them in the wild. Yeah. No, I haven't either. But I would suggest that if you are going to use roses, just to be on that topic, um, uh, 
try to get use roses that have the smelling capacity because that means they're less less hybridized. I, I have better faith in those than the ones that, that don't smell. And uh, let's see. There were some other things I wanted to say about roses. I'd like to take this moment oh. to congratulate myself on what a good picture I took with my cell phone. <laughs> Is that your cell phone? Yeah, that's a great, great Ferris wheel in the background. <laughs> That's cute. Do, do you have more uh, thoughts on that, Mike? Gulkand is the name in uh, Ayurveda for rose jelly. Rose, and and uh, that's made with with rose petals again. So uh, the wild rose is not the one that's normally used, but wild rose is used for the rose hips. All right, I'm done. And some, some like jelly jelly and some like gold. Right. So, um, Ephedra nevidensis is uh, our native ephedra, so relative to Ma Huang. There are differing opinions on whether this has any ephedrine alkaloids or not, um, but this, this is growing on the eastern slope a little bit further north. You'll see this in another species. There's uh, ephedra, there's two species that grow in the States, uh, and you know, you'll find them throughout all the western deserts in America, high, low, high and low deserts. Um, and this is probably about as far west as it grows uh, up on slopes uh, outside of Bridgeport. Uh, All I have to say about the, the question of ephedrine alkaloids and ephedrine evidences is this is one of the first herbs whose uh, constituents have been were studied between and a species that looks exactly the same that grows in Mongolia um, in the deserts there, and uh, in the United States. This this study was was done and very well known in, in the 1920s. And I spoke to somebody once who was uh, uh, evidently a part of that or or was very close with that study. And uh, definitely, uh, according to him, and and according to the widespread usage of it, as far as I can tell. It has no ephedrine alkaloids, and this is this is uh, seems to be a scientific fact. However, a lot of herbalists who live in the Midwest, wishful thinking, would like to think it's a, it's a it's a exchange for Chinese Ma Wong, and uh, I I think that if it was, uh, we would see it being promoted uh, and sold as a weight loss thing, just like it, just like Ma Wong was abused in that way. So let me uh, tell you that Ma Huang is available in in bulk, I believe, from Chinese uh, uh, distributors. But uh, a better thing to do is if you're living anywhere in the area where you can grow it, and I, I can I can grow it to a limited extent where I am here in the Santa Cruz Mountains, get some plants and start growing it because it, this is the, the most important herb uh, by far for all asthmatic and upper respiratory conditions. Uh, losing Ma Huang in the Chinese Materia Medica is like losing one of the one of the keys in the middle of the keyboard of a piano and trying to play a, a, a major concerto with it. Uh, if you don't have your Materia Medica represented with certain key herbs like Ma Huang, then you have a serious hole in it. And so uh, that leaves that, that begs the question of what is ephedra nevidensis used for? Besides Mormon tea and a, and a pleasant Midwestern. I, I will use it as an uh, one. I'll definitely use it as a uh, decongestant. You know, I do not think it has the very strong um, exterior releasing properties that Ephedra Seneca has, uh, nor the very strong adrenergic response that the ephedra produces. And uh, so it doesn't have the same bronchodilating response that uh, ephedra sinensis does, um, which, by the way, does work really well as a tincture. Uh, so, you know, if you can get some ma huang, you might deliver some aspects of its kind of profile of use uh, as a tincture. Um, what else do we use this for? So what else is ephedra used for? But also, uh, it's a strong diuretic. 
and is also used for arthritic conditions in which there is onset of you know strong onset of wind damp so there is you know kind of a, a wind water pattern where somebody suddenly takes on edema and that's what you see in the Shang Han Lun uh, ephedra used for you know that's what you wind see. dampness that's what it's used for in the Midwest arthritic rheumatic conditions mm -hmm. um, well in China that's what it's used for um, is right. is rapid onset acute edema you know so it's called a wind water pattern uh, and you'll see these same we, we mentioned the lingue jugan formula you know you'll see these tracta lotus poria um, I think a uh, yuebi tongue is is a similar cluster of fuling or poria uh, a tracta lotus um, Oh, what else is in that? Anyhow, so so it's these strong dampness draining, dampness percolating herbs along with ephedra used to further drain dampness out of the body. So it's it's not only being used for respiratory congestion or asthmatic scenarios. It's being used as a strong diuretic um, to eliminate rapid onset of water in the body. When you look at yeah, traditional both Native American and um, eclectic uses of some of these plants, it's similarly being used for arthritic conditions, you know, so for, um, you know, quote unquote, rheumatic conditions uh, in which there is you know, edema and swelling uh, in the interstices needs to be eliminated. So that's, you know, that's a historical perspective. That's, that's something I've used this a lot for. I have used it as a decongestant, given it to people for tea as tea. Um, you know, for which it is efficacious. It's a I delicious not, tea. It's a delicious tea, and I feel it is energizing. I feel like I've chewed on this, you know, and I've experimented with a lot actually with groups of people, um, where we're out in the desert and chewed on this and feel like there is a stimulant component or some energizing component. It is called Mormon tea, you know, because it was consumed on a regular basis by settlers uh, out west. Uh, you know, my understanding was as a stimulant substitute, you know, as a, a tea, coffee substitute. Yeah. Right. Do, you, do you have experience with it, Michael, that you value? No, I, I, uh, I've never really used it clinically. I've just uh, drunk it as a beverage and a tea with my students and so forth. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful tea. It gives a pale, pale kind of reddish color to the water. And, That's about it. Probably, I, I, I would, I would think that the that the roots are astringent against diarrhea, similar to the Chinese. That's one thing to experiment with. Ah, uh, yeah. So, for diarrhea. so yeah, for those of you astringent to the skin, mm -hmm. you know, that alleviates sweating specifically. It does. Um. So just to recap some of these, and look at. How many of these benefit the sinuses? You know, we know um, ambrosia. We talked about being an antihistamine decongestant. Decongestant. I have, I have a question about ambrosia for you. What's that? Um, first of all, uh, do you th do you think it's symptomatic relieving or curative, or both? Um, I have more experience using it as a symptomatic relief and as a prophylactic. So. Which is, you know, using it as a prophylactic is different than it being curative. Um, you know, if you're inoculating the system with it and people are not having an allergic response, yet they're dependent on that. It's not really curative. So, um, and also, and I know some herbalists who use that principle a lot more of regularly inoculating somebody a month before their allergy se season. Also, uh, Roswitha Lloyd commented that uh, she was taught to only harvest, uh, I believe it was uh, ambrosia before it starts to flower. Is that, is that your, um, your experience as well? Uh, that makes sense to me. And that makes sense with uh, Grindelia as well, you know, that it, as it's budding out. But I can testify that I've used them both a lot, a lot after they flowered 
and feel like it's just as efficacious a medicine. Mm -hmm. I can also testify that when I was driving in the car with the ambrosia that had already gone to flower and was pollinating the car, I was having severe respiratory distress. Um, but I've used the tincture, and it's make, and it's great medicine. It's fine. So, so if you're that, so if you're reacting to the to the uh, to the ambrosia, would you then just take the tincture to, to treat the reaction? Take the tincture. I, I have done that. I mean, I had it in the car already made, you know, in a formula that I prepare, uh -huh. and granted, it has other things in it, and that totally knocked out the response. So, it it is fun to. Uh, experience that. Okay. All right, great. Do, doing approving with the same herb. Uh -huh. So just paying attention to this cluster of things that was all growing near each other and how the different herbs can provide support for different parts of the respiratory uh, respiratory health. Um, you know, looking at things that are a few different herbs, ambrosia, solidago, and xanthium for acute distress potentially prophylactic distress for um, both for drying the sinuses uh, regardless of what the source is you know be it uh, aftermath of an upper respiratory infection that infected the sinus tract uh, these may be useful adjuncts in a formula xanthium in particular um, as a decongestant that you may use with other preparations uh, internally verbascum and Grindelia partner very well together. Uh, you know, Grindelia is useful in acute phase of respiratory distress, uh, be it due to asthma or due to an upper respiratory infection. Uh, I suspect it has some antimicrobial, antibacterial properties, uh, but is especially effective in the recovery phase. You know, so many people, you know, there, there's only so much you can do with herbs once somebody has, you know, really has something kick in. This is something that will provide people with a lot of relief and accelerate the rate at which they recover from uh, bronchitis uh, that is induced by virus or bacteria um, or other respiratory insults, um, pollution, uh, et cetera. I, I live in an area in which there is a fairly high pollution index uh, in particular, uh, near some of the worst areas of town, um, near near the port where there's a lot of uh, idling trucks is a particularly bad area of Oakland. Um, and there's really markedly higher asthma rates. And so in treating individuals who live there, you know, in children, more frequent colds and flus, higher rates of asthma, frequently use Grindelia and Verbascum and formula together. As a tincture. As a, as a tincture, yeah, definitely as a tincture. I mean, as I mentioned, I'll make a, a much much lower alcohol concentration tincture of Verbascum. Um, now, as far as Chinese herbs, you know, I may be combining these with, uh, very often combining with Shizandra or Wu Weidze. Uh, if there is phlegm, looking to the little block of herbs that is shishin or wild ginger, shizandra and dried ginger, ginger proper, uh, as a cluster that is commonly seen in Shang Han Lun formulas, most notably in the minor blue dream dragon combination, uh, or xiao qinglong tang, which also combines ephedra, penelia, um, I believe huang qin, scutellaria bicalensis, and uh, renchen. I'm 90% sure is in there. Could be wrong. Um, so th this is drying phlegm while engendering or promoting fluids at the same time. So if we look to these formulaic constructs as, as templates for how to create our Chinese formula or our Western herb formulas, you know, we might uh, combine verbascum, you know, as this fluid engendering herb that supports the chi of the lungs. Um, Forgive me if you're not liking Chinese medicine. Uh, you know, with Shizandra, which is also promoting the fluid of the lungs, uh, along with something like Grindelia, which is 
diffusing respiratory qi, get easier to breathe while dissipating phlegm. So this might encompass multiple parts of a formula like minor blue green dragon that is clearing phlegm at the source with the pineal uh, and clearing heat and making it easier to breathe, um, which is being performed by multiple herbs, whereas Grindelia is encompassing multiple parts of that formula, maybe not as strongly as you know, the three different herbs that are doing that, but it, it's certainly representing similar principles. So for those of you who are studying in the East-West course, um, starting to really wrap your head around principles of Chinese formulation. And in fact, of course, there's an exercise. It was always one of my favorite exercises in the course is creating Chinese herbal formulas with Western herbs. Um, I do that all the time. I do it every day in my practice. And really the study of formulation is, is, is one of the treasures of the art of Chinese medicine and one of my favorite things to engage with. And, and like, heck, am I going to put down you know, the Western herbs that I'm in love with? So integrating them into that works for me better uh, than trying to understand every biochemical pathway you know, for how to apply Western herbs. Uh, so, Michael, thank you for for turning me onto that notion via your course of you know implementing these into those uh, formulaic architectures. It's, very, it's a very fun activity. Um, yeah, and so the ephedra. We, we discussed the ways that it can and cannot be used. Obviously, this is. Uh, open to um, I'm, I'm still teaching a class. I have a four-year-old. <laughs> Just a few more minutes. Thanks. <coughs> 15 more minutes. Um, that's okay. <coughs> but before we do a, a quick recap of some of the other notions that we've taught, um, does anybody have any questions about these respiratory herbs? Yeah, everybody's been pretty quiet as far as I can tell. Um, I haven't seen any questions yet okay. <laughs> or comments. Um, so, so maybe. you know, be asking yourself what, what can supplement and strengthen the lungs from the Western repertoire? And, you know, obviously marshmallow has its ways that it can support the lungs. I think that... Um, Inula is a supplementing herb. Elecampane is definitely a supplementing herb when used uh, properly. I think that um, obviously uh, comfrey, you know, is a supplementing herb. And the ginsengs, American ginseng, um, the aurelias that grow uh, native in the United States, depending on how you use them, depending on the constitution and the lung condition, and also depending on how you prepare them. You know, so there's a tradition in making herbs more supplementing, uh, herbs that are potentially drying, making them more supplementing uh, by dry frying them and, and cooking them in honey. Um, and one may do this with the Aurelias or Inula in order to uh, make them more supplementing. Have any more thoughts, Michael? No, do you have more herbs to talk about, or should you go? Or should we just recap the ones that we talked about in the first seminar? Um, this this is everything, and I'll just really quickly go through okay. the things from the first seminar. Good. Uh, Ooh, that looks good. I'm getting hungry here. Really quickly, the <laughs> APACA family. So this is all back to the High Sierra, and we we really had a glorious trip, and I know that East West, in conjunction with uh, me and our cohort. Sylvan Institute, et cetera. Um, well, we'll do a, a quick little plug here. Um, Sylvan Institute of Botanical Medicine, Sylvan Botanical. Check us out. You know, we offer courses online and then also coordinate doing field classes, mainly in the West Coast with uh, friends and herbalists. And it's a really great opportunity to have more fellowships with other herbalists. It's like a it's like an intimate herb conference, and you know we usually have have quite a few really stellar herbalists out there who who really do use these plants clinically all the time, um, and we we cook for you. Uh, that's fun. 
um, Sylvan Institute, we uh, come check out. We offer a lot of free classes online too. So, and then Five Flavors Herbs is a extract company my wife and I run, and we produce a couple hundred single herb extracts and several formulas. We wholesale, we retail. Um, please take the time to look through this, and if you have questions about anything, um, it's it's all tinctures and a few oils and salves that we're we really put our heart and soul into this. My we have a family. My wife's in medical school, and we spend all our vacation time wildcrafting. Uh, so uh, this is like our ongoing, highly evolved bake sale <laughs> that our family does together. Um, See, Emily Snelling has a good question. Uh, <clears throat> she said, should yerba santa be tinctured fresh or dried? And she said she grew a, a bit this year and will be harvesting, drying it this week. Uh, I'm, I, I'm wondering if you can cultivate fresh. your your basanta also. Yeah, it it actually can get instated uh, in some place really nicely, and you can grow your basanta. I know, uh, that, I know that Christopher was actually coordinating with uh, some German scientists who are propagating it in uh, Arizona. So, so how, yeah, how, just, how would you grow it? Would you just take the plant and just tr transplant it? Because I, I, yeah, it seems like the plants I, I died back. Santa Cruz. You know, I grew some on Lance and Mary's property in Santa Cruz, and it did okay. And you it actually just, just transplanted it? Yeah. Uh-huh, okay. Um, right. But tincture is fresh. The, it's, it's much better as a tincture because of its resin content. It makes a delicious tea. I actually will uh, cook with it. In, I've made stocks out of it and sauces and it's it's pretty the sweetness comes out more in water but the the really useful efficacious medicine is best utilized as a alcohol extract um, i'm just going to you know take a minute with each of these Lagusticum gray uh we saw up in the high sierra is West Coast relative of OSHA, similarly is antiviral, antimicrobial, kind of broad spectrum. Antimicrobial can be used topically, internally, chewed on as a root, will anesthetize the throat uh, and deliver its you know, very strong antimicrobial effects uh, directly to where there is infection. Um, and then, of course, a great decongestant and you know, strong wind, heat, and cold treating herb for upper respiratory infections. I use a ton of it as a tincture. It's phenomenal medicine. Uh, here's a picture of Lagusticum grayi growing adjacent to Anemone drummondii, uh, looking up skyward. Uh, Angelica brewer, I, of course, we have three or four Angelicas that are commonly used in the Chinese Materia Medica, uh, in numerous formulas, Angelica dongwei. And then um, we have, I think there's five or six plants on the West Coast that are related to, in, that are angelicas uh, that are in the Western states, Oregon, Washington, uh, California. And this is one that I've developed an affinity for and use a fair bit medicinally. There's a wind cold damp alleviating herb for uh, cold rheumatic type conditions. So for um, you know, boggy type arthritic individuals who get worse, uh, when uh, get worse and get achy when the weather changes. Uh, that is a consideration for these. Think of the formula Duhua Jisheng or uh, Duhua Angelica and Loranthus combination that has all these different actions of drying wind, cold, damp, nourishing liver, kidney, and, and supplementing both chi and blood. This might be a useful adjunct and a reasonable substitute for that Duhua Angelica. Yeah, I guess uh, I learned from Brian that uh, that Angelica hendersonia, which grows on the coast, is not. You, you need to be careful of that one. So not all Angelicas are the same. Um, Osmoriza occidentalis is a related plant that uh, tends. To, I use it to transform dampness. I use it as an antifungal, both topically uh, and for treatment of. Uh, yeast infections, and we'll use this principle of combining this, which is uh, aromatic, 
and warm uh, along with things that are cold and bitter. So I might use this with uh, Yerba Manza and or Oregon Grape and or Desert Willow uh, internally, topically to treat damp heat conditions of the spleen uh, or the large intestine or um, vaginal candidiasis also, which more often than not will have a uh, the precedent, you know, this pathomechanism precedent of a of a dampness, damp spleen condition. Uh, Lomation uh, is another species that is related that's a notable antiviral, has a lengthy history of being partnered with uh, OSHA, with the Ligusticums by uh, Native Americans and settlers. Um, keeps them on hand for the next flu pandemic. That's so uh, this is an advertisement. This this is a advertisement for coming to the Tierra seminar, um, <laughs> one seminar in April, where I am the cook. Uh, this is a multi-sauce uh, camarones uh, that is shrimp taco. Um, we really turn out food like this. Which, when was the last time you went to a herb conference that had knock your socks off food, three meals a day, and you lost weight and felt good? There's no such thing except the East West Conference. Right, Michael? Yep. That's one of the great features is having you as our cook, for sure. It's a whole lesson <laughs> in itself, as everybody who's been there can attest to. So there's a few plants from the Lamiaceae family that we saw, and we're going to need to wrap up in a minute. Um, but Agastache uh, is really virtually identical to the Agastache used in Chinese medicine, which is Hua Xiang, uh, that is aromatic and transforming of dampness. So you know, use this for food poisoning, use this for hangovers, use it as a tea or make a tincture of it. Um, you can grow related species such as Agastache funiculum or Anis hyssop um, in your garden. This is in the Chicago Botanical Garden. Really stellar stand right there. Uh, it has a sweetness. I, I really enjoy it. There's a bit of a licorice -y flavor to it. Not everybody likes licorice. Uh, but I, I really enjoy this. Uh, grows throughout the High Sierra, you know, from on, on both sides. Of, of the mountains, so it covers a pretty wide range and enjoy harvesting this. We didn't see much of it this year because uh, there was a really poor snowpack and low amount of rainfall, uh, so it was all burned out what did uh, sprout out of the seeds. So, Mintha arvensis, we saw quite a bit of this growing on the east side of the Sierra. Now, some of the common attributes of the Lamiaceae family are that they're diaphoretic, uh, they are settling to the stomach, uh, and they alleviate depression. You know, they move the liver chi. So, mentha arvensis is something that I will put in formulas. You know, both to allay an upset stomach, or combine it with some other herbs depending on the condition. Uh, but I will also include it. You know, for this mood regulating uh, property, of course. Uh, Boha or field mint is a mintha, and that's um, one of the constituents added at the end of a decoction of shayasan, which many of you uh, likely know. Very strong antiseptic plant that can be used topically or internally uh, is monardella. Now, there's about 30 species that grow in California, um, and I was not keen on trying to key them out, but uh, it's a highly useful plant and can be used in tincture or as a tea um, for everything from upset stomachs to respiratory infections. Uh, use the tea for early onset uh, sore throats um, in those instances in which delivering something that is strongly antimicrobial directly to the source of irritation. Uh, and or the source of infection. This is a really good one for that. It is palatable. I use small amounts in cooking. 
Um, you know, we, we like to make faux Italian food uh, up in the High Sierra and do, do pasta. And add this to pasta sauces along with uh, other apiaceous herbs. Like we'll use uh, ligusticum leaf uh, and this, and make a pasta sauce. And it's really, it's really delectable. So I think this has been about an hour and a half, and I'm being summoned to dinner. Speaking of food, if anybody has any questions? Let's we see. we did cover pre we did cover pretty thoroughly the herbs for the treatment of pain and consciousness. So if you're interested in that, it's a really nice list of plants uh, from the first half of this that includes native valerians, that includes um, anemone or western pass flower. There's a discussion of peony. Some really profound key players uh, talk about argemony or prickly poppy. Some real clinical favorites of mine that Michael and I talked about quite a bit. Uh, so go and listen to that on the recording, which where are those, Michael? Uh, recording? Yeah. I don't know. Did you? Uh, I sent it to you. And uh, were you able to, to view it? Uh, you think I want to listen to myself talk? Well, because. Uh, <laughs> Was I supposed we're, to approve it? We're, this is being recorded. Yes, you do want to listen to yourself talk. <laughs> 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 no, I'm only kidding. So, uh, no, these these are going to be put up. Uh, they're, they're, we had some technical problems because.